Hey there! Welcome back to the Pixie Art Show. If you're new to the channel, welcome! I hope you stay and hang out for a bit. I'm Pixie, and I love drawing, so that's what I do here. My last several videos have been art and story times, but this one's going to be a bit different. I don't really want to box myself into just one type of video, and so I figured I'd start branching out a little bit. So last year, my partner got me super, super into Dungeons & Dragons stuff, and we ended up watching The Legend of Vox Machina, and then we started watching Critical Role's Campaign 2, The Mighty Nine, and me being a habitual character creator, I just had to make a D&D character, even if I never actually get to play the game. <laughs> so that's what I'm drawing for this video. You'll also notice that I'm including the sketching process in this video, which is something I haven't done since I made the switch to time-lapse recording. I'm doing that for a couple of reasons. First, it's to add a little bit more footage to the video. It'd probably end up being only like five minutes long otherwise. Second, I wanted to give you a bit more insight into my drawing process, especially for any young artists watching who might be a bit anxious about their own drawing process. I've said it before and I will say it till I'm blue in the face if I have to, but trust the process. Absolutely nothing looks good in the beginning stages, but as you'll see in this video, even the funkiest looking sketches can become pretty decent looking art in the end. Now, my digital art process is a bit different than my traditional drawing process. I find digital art to be a lot more forgiving, especially in the early stages. I try not to be too messy on paper so I don't have to erase as much and risk, you know, destroying the paper. Erasers and paper don't tend to get along all that well. And digital art just gives me the freedom to not really care how messy it is, so long as I can still pick out the important details. Though the undo button has definitely got me spoiled, <laughs> I quite often find myself trying to undo on sketchbooks. I will also highly, highly recommend using references when drawing, especially ones of poses and expressions that you wouldn't normally draw. As an artist, you want to expand your visual library as much as you can. Really, that'll just help your drawing process in the long run. Now, I personally tend to use Pinterest for my references, though I know that that site's apparently starting to go way downhill and is also getting a bit overrun with AI... pictures. I refuse to call that crap art, but I'm not here to talk about that, it'll just make me angry. <laughs> Back on the topic of messy sketches, I find being messy and loose in this stage can help with at least two things. I feel like it can really help with keeping your drawings from looking super stiff and help to give them a little bit more life as well as helping to keep your drawing arm relaxed. I'm sure we've all heard how important it is to draw from the shoulder, which honestly is kind of hard to get the hang of, but it can really save you from injury, especially if you're like me with a tendency to grip your pen to the point of hand and wrist cramping. I'm pretty sure I can hear the carpal tunnel calling my name. <laughs> You'll also probably notice how wonky the hands and feet look in my drawings. Hands especially are the bane of my existence. They're honestly even worse than backgrounds. And so I've basically just kind of stopped caring about how they look. Now, you should absolutely still practice drawing hands and anatomy in general. It'll be a lot easier to break the rules if you have a decent understanding of them first. And generally, just try to draw the parts that you hate drawing or you don't draw much as often as possible. Practicing is super, super important for art. It's, I mean, it's super important for any hobby or, or thing you want to do. So practice. And don't worry about how things look too much. Perfection is impossible. And it will just end up killing your motivation and creative flow. Don't strive for perfection. So a little bit about this character. She is obviously a tiefling character, if you couldn't tell from the horns and the tail. And she's a bard that plays acoustic guitar, mostly because I can also kind of play acoustic guitar. 
I know, I know, it's not technically a D&D instrument, but I don't really care. <laughs> this whole character came from a silly joke, and I wasn't even originally going to develop her. But here we are. I've also never really drawn horns on a character before, or a guitar, so bear with me if the proportions are a bit, or a lot, off. <laughs> I may have been drawing for years, but I am still learning new things all the time. Like, for instance, I just recently had to go find a course on learning the basics and the foundations of drawing. Because, again, I still, I have no idea what I'm doing half the time. <laughs> really, you should never, ever stop learning. It's, I mean, it's good for your talents, it's good for your hobbies, and it's good for your brain. I will also be talking a little bit more about this character a little later on in the video, so stick around for that. And I'll also tell you how exactly I came up with the idea. It does explain her design, in case you're wondering why she has so many horns. Now the last couple of sketches, I wanted to draw her wearing more modern type clothing. And I originally planned to have her wearing some sort of cute autumn themed outfit. But, when I looked up references for the outfit, I ended up getting the urge to crochet myself an autumn-colored cardigan with some leftover yarn I had from my Doctor Who scarf. And so I ended up taking six days to do that before I got back to work on this video. I'm so, so bad for that. Procrastination is one of my major weaknesses, and I kind of sometimes get distracted really easily. I am working on it. It's difficult, but I am working on it. <laughs> the cardigan came out super cute and cozy though, especially considering it's the first one I've ever made. So it was worth it, really. <laughs> I also had a lot of trouble figuring out a pose for that last sketch on this page. I wanted to take up as much of the leftover empty space as possible, but nothing was working out for me. I think I drew her three, maybe four different times before I finally settled on something. But even, even in the end, I wasn't super happy with it. Originally, I decided I wanted to do a side profile of her, kind of looking a bit forlorn or something, I guess. I don't really know. But, I don't know, I think I might have been drawing her just too small. And I couldn't get her nose and her mouth right, not even to mention the horns. It just didn't want to come out looking good. And even when I tried to draw her a bit bigger, I still couldn't get the horns and the hair to look quite right. Something was off about it. It's, it's obvious to me that I need to do more work or more practice in side profiles. I don't quite do them all that often, so we know what I need to work on. <laughs> Though honestly, watching the video back, that last attempt I made actually did kind of look okay, and I probably could have made it work, but hindsight is 2020, and well, it is what it is. Overall though, I am happy with how all of these sketches came out, especially the top three, more specifically the, the one of her playing the guitar. I really do like how that one turned out. Now when I start my line art, the first thing I generally do is flip the canvas, and I do all of the inking with the canvas flipped. You've probably seen other artists do this, and the main reason for it is to give yourself a new perspective of the piece. Looking at your art at a different angle, or even leaving it for a few hours or a few days and coming back to it at a different time, can help you see things that need to be fixed that you might otherwise miss. The vast majority of the time when I flip my canvas, I immediately notice how crooked the faces are. Like the eyes are a little bit off, off kilter or the mouth is too far over to one side. And so inking this way lets me even things out. Though I will also say that you should often flip your canvas back to its normal orientation and zoom out to make sure that everything still looks right. Always, always take a step back from your work to see how it's looking. Your brain can get so used to looking at things a certain way, especially if like 
if you're like me and you're zoomed in to 200% for long periods of time. It is incredibly disheartening to be working on a piece for several hours at a time, thinking it's looking absolutely amazing, only to zoom back out or flip your canvas again and realize that you're going to have to redo all of the liner because somehow you've managed to draw the character's face at a 90 degree angle or something. Doing the liner is probably the most tedious part of drawing for me, but it is also one of the most important parts of my particular process and style. It's where I can start fixing any flaws that I see, straightening things out, making the hands look at least a smidge better, or straight up drawing them entirely, and really just adding any extra details that I might have left out in the original sketch. I also use a textured pen for my lines, mostly because I just love how it looks, but it also helps to hide how shaky I am, so that I don't have to try so hard to keep my hands steady. Otherwise, my lines are all over the place. <laughs> and now we've reached the part of the video where I basically rage quit and had to take another few days off working on this video. There's a couple, but well, there's a few reasons why this video is a lot later than I wanted it to be. So when I got about halfway through inking the third sketch, the one of her like dancing-ish, I guess, I realized that the line art layer and the sketch layer had at some point merged. And I think I could only, I think in Krita you can only undo so far back to like the last time you saved. So of course I could only, I could only go back so far because I had saved multiple times at this point. And so I ended up having to redo the entire inking process from scratch. Now this isn't the first time this has happened and it's probably not going to be the last. I am usually far more careful, but it does sometimes still get me. I don't know if it's a problem with my art program, which again is Krita, or if it's an issue with my Hueyon tablet, but sometimes when I hit the left click button on my pen, which I have set as an erase button shortcut, it'll merge my layers. I don't actually have a merge layer shortcut set on any of my tablet or pen buttons, so I genuinely have no idea what happens for this to do for, for it to do this. It doesn't even usually bother me, as I generally keep all of my lower layers locked if I'm not working on them. And I mean I would I would do that anyway, I would recommend doing that anyway, just in case you don't want to accidentally delete something. I've done that before too. <laughs> but there are times when I just completely forget to lock those layers, and then I end up in this particular situation. I do plan on eventually buying a copy of Clip Studio Paint and switching over to that, and I'm hoping that making that switch will help. Though if it's an issue with my tablet, I'm just gonna have to live with it and live in denial about it, because that's still the best drawing tablet I've ever used and I don't want to switch to anything else. I love my Hueyon. I love it. <laughs> Honestly though, having to redo the line art for this video wasn't really a huge disaster. And I used it as a good reason to make some tweaks and vary the line weights a little bit more. Varying the thickness of your lines is one of the best ways to really make your art pop and make it a bit more eye-catching. Now, you don't have to use super thick lines like I do here or other cartoonists like me do. Um, you don't have to use a textured pen brush, that's just what I like. You don't even have to have proper line art in your work. It's whatever works or whatever you like to use the most. It took me several months to finally land on an art style that I enjoy drawing and could really make my own. It took me months to figure out that I wanted to do these particular kinds of lines. My art inspirations are a little bit all over the place, and so my style is kind of an amalgamation of all the different techniques and styles that I have enjoyed and tried over the years. The best way to find your art style is to not even think about your art style. 
don't worry about it at all. But you should also study your favorite artists and try out different ways of doing things to see what works best for you. Doing all those things and practicing regularly will help your style to develop. That will come with practice and time. Just, you know, be patient about it. I really believe that your art and your process should make you happy first. It's your creative journey and it should be a fun and happy adventure. Or at the very least, could also be a good outlet to process some heavier emotions. Art is, art's magical and it should be enjoyed and loved and it shouldn't be a chore, if that makes any sense. Anyway, about now feels like a good time to talk a little bit more about how I came up with this character. She's actually my second D&D character. My first one was a Vulpin character based on the fox-like race from Hit Point Press's campaign called Humblewood. I am I'm obsessed with foxes, they're my favorite animal, so I really wanted to make a fox character. Unfortunately, I haven't actually done anything with her recently, and I kind of abandoned her, and I do feel bad about that. But I also really, really wanted to make a tiefling character at some point, and so I just decided to start properly developing this joke character that I'd come up with a few months ago. The basic idea was to have a tiefling with some sort of, like, mutation that caused excessive horn growth. Originally, she was going to have horns going all down her back and tail, or horns coming out of her shoulder blades like wings. But I couldn't really figure out the logistics of it, of how it would work with her outfit, and it just would have ended up being way too complicated. So, I ended up settling on face and ear horns that look a little bit like piercings, uh, the two sets of horns on her head, and the little shoulder horns. I made her a bard, because of course they're notorious for trying to seduce anyone or anything they come in contact with, and I, I just really wanted to play a bard. <laughs> and anyway, with the multiple horns, she would end up being nicknamed the Horny Bard. The thing with that is, though, is that the way she was raised ended up causing her to be super naive and innocent about the world around her. So she doesn't understand dirty jokes or innuendo or even the double entendre of her, of her title. She's actually convinced that the name is entirely literal. She is a bard and she has a lot of horns. Makes sense. <laughs> I also named her Roxanne after the police song. Um, I call her Roxy for short. And I just, I love her so much. I love her, she's so cute. She may have started out as a joke, but she very quickly became one of my favorite characters that I've ever created. I even wrote up like a whole backstory for her. She has a whole backstory. Like she is ready to go if I ever do get to play. <laughs> Now, I know I've probably broken about 101 rules in creating this character. And yeah, there will probably be people out there that absolutely hate her, but that's fine. She's my character, I made her for me, and I had a lot of fun creating her. In my opinion, gatekeeping and elitism in fandom is stupid and incredibly harmful. People are allowed to like and enjoy things. You know, so long as you're not actively harming someone, you should be allowed to enjoy whatever you want without fear of guilt and ridicule. You want to go out and make a super self-indulgent character? Go for it. I, sh I certainly do. All of my webcomic characters that I've created for the webcomic I'm working on are super self-indulgent. They are so tropey, but I love them. <laughs> I will, however, recommend looking up what makes a Mary Sue and a Gary Stew. So you can avoid having like a Bella Swan situation or any of the main OCs in the two fanfiction.net stories that I was working on back in 2011 or 2012, I think. I recently found my old fanfiction profile and I decided to read a couple of paragraphs of the first chapter of my Bleach fanfic and oh boy, <laughs> the cringe is so very real. It's so bad, but... 
absolutely hilarious. Like, you can make a super tropey character with a tragic backstory, but please make sure you learn how to make them well-rounded as well. You want to have proper flaws and strengths and things. Tripping over air is fine as a flaw, but it shouldn't be the only or even the main one. And yeah, you can make them super likable, but they still shouldn't be universally loved by every other character in your story. I mean, no one is everyone's cup of tea. I'm definitely not everyone's cup of tea, so, you know, you gotta make it realistic. At least a little bit. Oh look! We finally made it to the actual coloring portion of the video. I told you, inking is super tedious for me, and that's mostly because it takes me forever. But that's okay because I don't really take too long to add colors, shadows, and highlights. It helps that I knew going in that Roxy was going to be pink with dark purple horns and light purple hair and orange eyes. These are pretty much my favorite colors, so I incorporate them in her design. <laughs> it is definitely a good idea to learn color theory at some point, um, and I do have a very, very basic understanding of it. At least I think I do. I mean, primary and secondary colors, uh, complementary colors, etc, etc. <laughs> but when it comes to selecting colors for my own work, I kind of tend to just choose on instinct. I'll try something out and if it works, fantastic. If it doesn't, I'll just try something else until I find what works and looks good to me. That being said, with m some of my bigger pieces, like my last few videos for instance, I did go into that with, a, with at least a basic idea of the main palette that I wanted to use. A good example of that is the cafe piece that I did a while ago, I think for my first video back in the summer-ish. I knew that I wanted to use a lot of oranges and warm, warm colors for like a warm cafe glow. So I chose all of my colors with that in mind. Roxy's main outfit for this was actually super, super easy to choose colors for. Seeing as how she herself is fairly brightly colored, it seemed like a good idea to put her in slightly desaturated, more muted tones. I actually really like muted, earthy tones anyway, so I tend to use them a lot in my, in my art. And I really do think that this outfit is just super cute on her. I kind of want it myself. <laughs> I originally had her in pants, but the dress feels like it suits her personality and her character a lot better. And honestly, I just wanted to draw a flowy skirt with a flowy sash. <laughs> Her guitar ended up being black and red, because the one I have looks pretty much identical, and I just didn't really feel like being any more creative with it than that. <laughs> if you're wondering how I got that sort of glow-esque around the whole of the guitar, I used an airbrush for that, and used it again to add darker bits around the face of the guitar. Honestly, the airbrush is an excellent tool for adding gradients and any sort of like soft, warm, or soft kind of glow. Now I also, I do want to apologize if it's difficult to see the shading process here. I always, always intend to do the shading with the colors turned off so you can actually see what it is I'm doing. But I never really remember to do that until I've already finished exporting the video. It's, it's, I'll try to keep it in mind for the next videos, genuinely. But I kind of keep my shading pretty simple, so there's not really a whole lot to it. I turn my shadow layer to multiply and usually use either a light shade of blue or purple. And I really only ever do the one layer of shadow, unless, I, unless it's like a darker scene and I need to add a little bit more shadow. The highlights are just as easy. I set the layer to overlay. Pick a yellowish orange and use the airbrush to add the base highlights. I add a second overlay layer to add the hair shine and set that layer to 50% opacity. And then I go back to the first layer 
to add extra highlight details here and there. Mostly on anything that needs a bit of shine or on the darker areas to just kind of make them pop a little bit more. Really, there isn't much to the shading and the highlighting in my process, so it doesn't really need too much explanation, I guess. But I'm getting pretty close to the end of the video here, and there are a couple of things that I'd like to mention before I go. Firstly, I started a new cleaning job a couple of months ago because I needed a job and money. <laughs> and it's started to get pretty busy now, and pretty much all of my shifts have been overnights. I'm still trying to get used to the overnight schedule, it's messing me up quite a bit. And that's kind of another reason for this video being so late. So I don't really know what my upload schedule is going to be like going forward. It might be a little bit all over the place. I am going to do my absolute best to keep consistent with it. But I don't really know when my next video is coming up. It's going to be coming out. I will still be making videos and I do want to get back into making shorts again soon as well. And I am absolutely still working on the webcomic. I actually just recently got to the end of the first case, so I can start actually scripting this now, which is super exciting! I am also trying to be a bit more active on Blue Sky. Really that's the, the one social media that I've kind of taken to, and it doesn't have anything to do with meta or Twitter's stupid AI crap, so I really like it. Um, so you can follow me over there if you want any updates on what I'm doing art-wise. Um, with, you know, a few random ramblings in between as well. But yeah, that's where I'm going to be the most active, so that will be the best place to follow me. The link will be in the description below. I also had an idea for a video series potential. Um, so I'm thinking of doing an analysis of my old Bleach fanfic for my, ne for my next video where I maybe read a couple of chapters from it and both roast the heck out of it and make fun of my younger writing self because I think it would be funny and pick it apart to, you know, see what could have actually worked, see what I might have done right and what just really didn't work. I feel like it might be a fun little series kind of thing um, to give a little bit of maybe tips and hint or tips and advice on how to write, how to not write, what to avoid, things like that. So if you'd like to see that, let me know in the comments down below and I'll see about getting started working on that. And that's pretty much it for this video. I know it's a lot longer than um, the last couple have been and I do apologize for that. I had a lot to say. But if you've made it to the end here, thank you so much for watching. I greatly appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed, and I also hope that it was at least maybe a little bit helpful and informative. Um, I'm not really necessarily great at doing tutorials and stuff, but I don't know, I kind of just wanted to do a sort of tutorial video, so here we are. But anyway, I look forward to seeing you all in the next one, and I'll see you again later. Bye for now!